Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. Welcome to our ADEX webinar. Uh, this is a joint collaboration between ADEX, Magnetic and uh, two other universities. Uh, University Malaya, University Technical Malaysia Melaka atau UTM and our University Islam Antarabangsa Malaysia or IIUM. So we'll be having three panelists today and uh, largely we will be talking a very hot topic on uh, because of this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We have uh, three panels who will discuss and we will talk about and we will question and um, challenge our minds and our mindset about teaching and learning delivery. So there's a lot of things that has been affected by COVID-19 pandemic as us as lecturers where we have to do our classes online, we have to do our assessment, we have to really think of our assessment, how to make sure our students are not copying when they have the Google just right in front of them while they are answering the questions, the exams. But we will not be talking about the assessment bit. We will, we will focus more on the delivery section, the delivery um, um, aspect of uh, teaching and learning. We are still, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are still in our week, our early semester, our week three, week four, yeah, of our semester currently. In University Malaya, we are in week four. I just talked to Dr. Zul. Dr. Zul also said, and UTEM is also in week four. Um, so largely, we are still at the very beginning stage of uh, our online classes with our students. So this topic or this, this subject of teaching and learning delivery is very timely for us now to talk about and we still have time to um, improve our skills on our teaching and learning delivery online with our students. So with us now, I would like to introduce, if, if we have Dr. Rose with us uh, already, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. <clears throat> so we have from University Malaya, our very own ADEC, our Director uh, of Academic Enhancement and Leadership Development Centre, Associate Professor Dr. Farah Dina Yusof. So, hello Dr. Farah, nice to meet you. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Every one of us are working from home. So, uh, don't be don't be shocked if you see my little girl walking beside me and panjat my, my lap. So, the nose knocking already. Mama, okay, never mind. And we have uh, from UTEM, uh, University Technical Malaysia Melaka, we have uh, Dr. Zulisman Matso. There he is. Uh, he's the director of Center for Instructional Resources and Technology. So, dalam bahasa Melayu, Pusat Sumber Teknologi dan Pengaj uh, Pengajaran, ya? Yeah? Yes. So, Dr. Zulisman uh, has been the director there for, for, for a while now. And we'll be, it'll be very interesting to listen his from his insights. We also have Dr. Ros Maliza Kamaluddin. Assistant Professor from uh, Faculty of Education, Kuliah of Education, call it, University Islam Antarabangsa Malaysia. So, very happy to have you, Dr. Rose. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. So, we have, uh, we are streaming live now. Uh, uh, audiences are from, we believe, from all over Malaysia. Uh, this is a collaboration, a joint collaboration with Magnetic. Uh, our Majlis uh, Pusat Pengajaran and uh, Teaching and Learning Centers all, all over Malaysia, University Awam. So, um, we have a few questions to talk about. Um, you to our learning platform right now, for the audience, you might have access to the discussion board on the sign where you also will be able to see our um, input. So, um, from time to time, our organizers will put up the link to your feedback session. So, at any time at all, if you're registered, at any time at all, you could uh, key in your feedback about this session and you'll be able to get a digital certificate after the whole session has ended. So, if you would like to get a digital certificate on this session, you're more than welcome to answer our feedback um, questionnaire on the side and you can also write in your questions there. It will be moderated by our um, back, uh, our organizers and they will pass it to us. So without further ado, maybe I can welcome each and every one of the panel to, to introduce themselves more 
more detailed or more intimately of what their experience has been in the COVID-19 pandemic when it all started in March. What was your experience and how? what have you learned from it? Um, from a personal level as a lecturer yourself and as someone who's who has influence or has, who has feedback on on the university level maybe i can start with dr farah just a slight uh, one minute introduction from you dr farah hello assalamualaikum everyone um, first i would like to thank you as the moderator of the session Thank you, Magnetic um, and University Malaya for co-hosting this event. Um, I would like to um, say hello and assalamualaikum to my dear panelists. Have not seen them um, in quite a while <laughs> during this pandemic, so we'll just meet online. It was good to see you. Um, uh, my name is Farah Dina Yusuf. I am an associate professor at uh, University of Malaya, to be specific at uh, Department of Curriculum and Instructional Technology, Faculty of Education. I am also currently uh, holding uh, the position as Director of University of Malaya's uh, Academic Enhancement and Leadership Development Center, or ADAC, uh, which is the center um, helping the academics in the university to be up to date with um, current pedagogies and also technological tools. Um, we also involve in a lot of uh, research um, and development as well. So um, to be honest, um, I can say that uh, I can see it from more on the administrative uh, perspective because MCO in April uh, started. I was just came back from my sabbatical leave, nine months sabbatical leave. Okay, in my first day of um, La Pordiri uh, or appointment, I was brought to, into the office and uh, straight away have to deal with online teaching and learning to be implemented at University of Malaya. And, and uh, I was not really uh, ready, but I was just excited to, you know, to, to share whatever uh, we have done previously at ADEC with all the university staff. So in this current semester, I am teaching uh, an academic course, uh, Masters in Instructional Design and Technology. So I have a little bit of experience from the perspective of a lecturer. So if you don't mind, uh, I will say that uh, from administrative point of view, in the very first half uh, of the year in, in um, March and April and June, we were a little bit busy uh, putting things in place, especially process and procedures, right? Uh, in, at University of Malaya, we were uh, dealing with adjustment of the curriculum um, and also academic calendar, where we prolong or extend the mid-semester break uh, while trying to figure out uh, what to be done. And, and that was the time when we tried to make everything um, visible um, and that everybody are uh, were prepared to teach online. So um, there's a lot of um, rules, guidelines, um, tutorials being circulated around. Uh, and I think um, in the April, things are a little bit um, okay and, and stable so people started to teach online quite fine i can say uh, during this second phase of mco i think that people are much more comfortable with the new norm of online teaching and learning um, and i can sense that the students are also enjoying <laughs> the online teaching and learning so i i can see that this is um, something positive coming out from the pandemic um, even though we, we also acknowledge the sufferings and also um, the loss that people out there are having. I mean, that's all introduction from me, Azza. Thank you, Dr. Farah. So thank you, Dr. Farah. I will, I will, uh, I will now pass to Dr. Zul from the, the uh, UTEM, from UTEM to introduce yourself and some experience and personal 
uh, insights. Thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, Assalamualaikum and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Zulisman, just call me Zul. I'm the director for the Center of Instructional Resources and Technology or PSTP in UTEM. Um, actually, I was, I'm, I'm becoming the director since last December only, so about almost a year, and suddenly the un unfortunate event came in, <laughs> so it become like a challenge, just like Dr. Farah said, you know, you just came back from the sabbatical, <laughs> suddenly things coming in. Uh, but for me, the COVID-19 has become a blessing in a disguise, I guess. It's not only for UTEM, but I think for the whole countries, especially in the academic worlds, where uh, this is probably the times that we, you know, uh, what we call it, you know, things that we need to change, can be changed. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, PSTP has made a lot of uh, progress. Um, previously, we, you know, uh, e-learning is, is, not, is not part of the priority in our, you know, our universities, you know, because of 90% uh, of our courses, basically, and engineering courses where actually they have to be uh, abide by the uh, accreditation bodies and so on. Uh, but due to this COVID-19, I guess that everybody now realize that, you know, online learning has become part of our life, not from, from this year, but probably onward. And, and we believe that anything impossible can be possible. Um, a bit of background of myself, I'm actually graduated with graphic design, actually, computer graphic design, um, uh, specializing in interaction design, instructional design, and and I did my masters in, in I did my degrees in New Zealand, my masters in UK, and my PhD in Australia. So uh, all those experience came back to me that actually uh, outside there, you know, online learning has become part of the normal life for them because of uh, long life learning is considered as a normal things in 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 this country. So. Um, become a director for this uh, center actually is, is quite challenging because of I'm dealing with uh, almost 700 over active lecturers from engineering background and also non-engineering background and some of them actually this is considered new having uh, fully online classes is actually is considered new and I believe you know the only things that we need to do now under PSTP is to keep pushing them uh, to do something beyond than what they can do um, and, you know, only by that, I believe, you know, this online learning, we call it, you know, can become not only a, a short kind of uh, event, but is going to be part of the academic world in, in our universities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zul. So we are, we are seeing an insights from, from, from the directors of the, 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 the unit or the center that is responsible to make that change. So the, these are the, the, the centers that, 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 that does that pushing factor, that, that instills that, that need. Before that, it wasn't really seen as a real need, but uh, we've heard from Dr. Farah, Dr. Zul himself, that as a challenge, this is like a wake up call and okay, everyone wake up, we have to change. I mean, yeah. people are already changing and we, we are still in our own sweet spot, you know, not, not having that need. But because of this, that, that shook has, has happened. So I'd like to um, get some insight from Dr. Rose now. Uh, how did you how did you feel about the whole thing? And maybe introduce yourself before that. I know uh, I, I should introduce Dr. Dr. Rose as part of our magnetic member uh, for a few years before this. So yeah, welcome Dr. Rose, please. Thank you, Dr. Azza. Uh, it's good to see everybody again. Assalamualaikum yes. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and uh, very good morning to everybody who's watching, uh, whether live or the recorded version. Uh, it's wonderful to be in this uh, discussion group uh, because it uh, because there's still a lot to talk about, even though we've been in it for almost, you know, about six, seven, eight months now. Uh, there are still room uh, for you know discovery there's lots more to learn so i am Rus maliza muhammad kamaluddin and i teach at the kulia of education international islamic university malaysia uh, my specialization is instructional technology so basically online learning is like my cup of tea uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um i was uh at the administrative position um, before this whole thing happened, 
uh, and then I was on, you know, some sort of a sabbatical, like uh, Dr. Farah and Dr. Zulisman as well. Uh, and even during the COVID-19, I'm still on leave. Uh, so what I get to see is I get to see the perspective from an outsider and also the, the perspective of a lecturer on the field. Because although I am uh, on leave uh, for quite a long time, I am still active in doing online uh, teaching, uh, whether voluntary or when people ask me to help um, or just, you know, testing out some different programs on my own. Uh, the struggle is real, definitely. Uh, it is good on paper. Uh, however, when we go down on the field, then we will see the actual struggles of lecturers as well as students. Because um, I have an 18-year-old with me who's supposed to be enjoying his first semester as a university student. <laughs> However, he's stuck at home, uh, having the university at home and with a lecturer mom. In the <laughs> so it's not easy for him, it's not easy for me. So when people say, oh my, my students are not there, they're not switching on the camera, you know, I don't know whether they're learning or not. Aha, uh -huh, I see it in front of me, in front of my face. Um, nine o'clock in the morning, I can hear the lecturer's voice uh, through the laptop. But when I open the door, my son is still under the covers. So <laughs> I say, are you not having class? And I say, yeah, I logged in. That's an honest confession, Dr. Rose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's there. <laughs> so, first hand experience, you want to ask about the student side? I have it. You want to <laughs> But the parents' side, I have it. <laughs> but the lecturer's side, go ahead. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of stories to tell today. <laughs> so back to you, Dr. Azza. Thank you. I know. Yes, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. And yeah, I'm, I'm quite frank with my students. When, when, when we have a large class, I don't usually ask them to switch on their cameras, but when we are in a smaller group, uh, I, 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 I like to see their faces, you know, uh, <clears throat> because we are so used as lecturers, we are so used of seeing people in front of us. I think it's that, it's that validation factor that, that, that we are seeking, that you get it, Do you, you know, you, you, you want to see it in their eyes, that at least their blank face, but they are nodding and say, okay, we can proceed to the next point, you know. <laughs> We are missing that. We are missing that. But uh, yeah, like Dr. Rose, um, uh, I, I asked one student, uh, Arvin, why are you not switching on your camera? Everyone's switching. Doctor, I just woke up. I don't think I want to switch on the camera. <laughs> I, could, I could, from the voice, I could see she's still under the covers on the bed, but joining. So I think it's, it's some task that we have, to, or some mindset change that we have to, realize that um, our role is to, to 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 share the content and to deliver and somehow design that's where the designing comes in I'll get to you dr dr Zul of the designing bit of of, of, of the points but it I think it's it's something that we are not used to and we don't have enough time to do the training for and um, and uh, if you if you don't have that first hand experience like what Dr. Rose has, you know you have an Dr. Rose has all the advantage as a parent, as an 18 year old parent. The students are there. For those who does not have like I have, my baby was born during PKP. So PKP is seven eight months. That's how old my baby is. He was born two days into PKP. So my my baby's right. So I do not have that experience of you know um, the ground. What's happening on the ground? So um, maybe Dr. Zul can touch a little bit on that 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 design part of how, how the lecturer should think of when 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 what's the design principle? You know, just a little bit of of what you key point that you should take note on, Dr. Zul. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Zul. Kejap. Now. Uh, when we've been given this opportunity to to re, to transform ourselves, actually, I, I believe in a, what we call it a transformational mind. 
uh, because technology just uh, merely a technology it's just a tool eh? so we have to believe on that tool is actually human creation it's not god creation so if we scared with that our own creation then we will not going to move on so the first thing that actually the lecturers need to to think of is actually to to have this transformational mind so when the class being conducted through brick and mortar we call it right um you know we use certain technologies such as we using the slide presentations we use projectors and so on but when the class being conducted fully online when we are not meeting with the student we do not have our student in front of us the technology actually is become the center of the stage uh, the lecturer is no longer become the center of the stage um, so this is where the transformational mind need to happen where actually we have to believe that you have to put yourself in their shoes you know as a student being as a lecturers we have our phd we have our professorships and so on we know that you know even you put a single word you will be able to to elaborate those thing for one hour but for the student to understand a single point of from your powerpoint that's impossible so it, it means that designing the content through online is not simply uh, taking an apple and you convert it to become another apples so you need to take this apple and then you need to convert it to become an orange so it means that in 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 a more direct word your powerpoint alone that you uploading it into your lms cannot be used as your teaching tool to deliver an effective uh, online learning you must convert that <laughs> uh, apples to become an orange your powerpoint must become you so and and it's not easy because of it requires a lot of things so it means that instead of we become a lecturers you know who actually we teaching the student uh, while i'm talking you are listening now our role actually you you need to become a creator you know you you must become a content creator and to become a content creator i believe is not easy because of not everybody become a content creator but we don't expect actually the lecturers in within this one years to become a content creator because of if we talking about knowledge it's it's a very vast outside there you google it you will find everything the one that actually we need to understand is how to pick something which is valid which is suitable for our student and be because of that then only actually the student will start learning uh, what we call it independently when it become online learning actually the first thing that the lecturers need to remove from the mindset is actually to say that while i'm talking you are listening because of learning is no longer like that it it, it become what we call it a, um, a self independent learning so the responsibility of learning must be given back to the student so this is the first day of the class that the lecturers need to tell the student that's why even myself i don't call myself a lecturers nowadays i always call myself as a facilitators i'm facilitating the thing so designing the curriculum will be very much easy uh, through online if we always believe that i'm facilitating the process of learning through online i, I think that's the the basic uh, fundamental of it then later on probably we can expand that if if there's a further discussion yeah thank you dr zul um thank you dr zul we will get to how it if it's done at a more higher level yeah. at the university level yeah from maybe we can ask dr faradina from 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 um to share how is it done at um level how did we cope with it and maybe you want to share um the the, the steps and the strategies that we have uh, done dr fala thank you dr azza um yeah it was very interesting to hear from dr zul and also uh, later we'll hear from from dr rose about their experiences on the ground um from administrative point of view i think this is the time when teaching and learning center in each university plays a big role um, we are not just helping the students but we are trying to develop the competencies of the lecturers as well so this is very important aspect because if we lectures, um, the students will not be as well <laughs> okay um, there will be another center supporting students with all sorts of uh, systems for example for admissions for final examination and so on but the pedagogical approaches that the lecturers um, will apply during the teaching and learning processes is very important 
So from that point of view, I think that um, I can share what we have done at ADAC, um, what we have done before, during, and future, right? So the first thing that we did um, was to make sure that uh, all lecturers have common understanding about what online teaching and learning is. Um, so we started off with uh, discussing and then publishing a guideline for all lecturers to use. Uh, you can find the online teaching and learning guideline in our edec.um.edu.my edec um, under the resources, I believe. We have a campaign we call UM Teach Online. So every resources that we have, uh, we gather, we put it on the website with the hashtag UM Teach Online. So I think that is a very uh, important um, document that we have uh, in the early stage to make sure that everybody understand what online teaching and learning is. The second thing that we do is to share with them how to go about doing it. Um, we are focusing on the delivery aspect of the teaching um, and learning online. So some of the things that we did uh, was to introduce to them the tools and most importantly, they were so, um, I can say, excited to learn more about the learning management system of the university, even though they have been using it for quite some time since uh, it was first invented, but this time they paid more attention, which I really, really like. Uh, Dr. Farah is breaking, Dr. Farah. Um, oh, well, Dr. Farah, sorry. We don't share the slides you have. Maybe you want to share the slides you have. So we are talking. Uh, uh, yes. Let me try to fill in while while you are there. The the have the the online uh, UM Teach Online hashtag that we have the campaign uh, really help to pull things together. That 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 um, becomes a a hashtag that people go to when when it, we, they have trouble looking for and the posters we we build. So yeah. I'll pass it back to Dr. Farah now to, to share with you the series that we have. Yes, thank you, Dr. Alza. Sorry about the internet connection. <laughs> um, so this is what I was talking, trying to talk about. We have the hashtag on UM Teach Online campaign, uh, and we um, introduce a lot of webinars, um, teaching tools, uh, online delivery approaches to the lecturers. And we also do um, try to reach out to all lecturers. Um, in University of Malaya, we have more than 2,000 academic, like, academic staffs or lecturers, and that excludes um, the adjunct professors, uh, uh, pro visiting professors, and so on. So the only way that we can think of to reach out to them uh, and to make it personalized communication is through WhatsApp and also Telegram channels. Uh, Alhamdulillah, so far we have created an and many people have subscribed our three WhatsApp channels and also our Telegram channel. So we keep on updating them about uh, what kind of tools to use, what webinars that they can attend and so on. Um, another thing is that to make, make sure that our um, website is well refined resources. So if you look into our ADEC website, you can see that a lot of guidelines on teaching and learning, uh, videos that we can gather from many, many institutions, um, whether from uh, internal or, or national level, we share it online with them. We also have our own uh, blogs. Uh, then everything, whatever related to online teaching and learning, we put it there so that they can use it and refer to it. I would like to mention that we also have, um, during this pandemic time, we still go on with our Emerald program. Okay? Emerald program is a program for new lecturers who just joined University of Malaya. Um, every year, we have about four rounds or four series of Emerald program. And we run it using
a fully online course. Uh, it will be five days online courses with all the assignments that the lecturers have to do. And we had a little bit of challenge in the beginning, um, especially to change the mindset of the lecturers. You can imagine that our lecturers are not just sitting you know, on the desk and, and just um, trying to absorb all the knowledge. They are working people. They, they are working as doctors in, in PPUM, the Pusat Perubatan University Malaya, University Malaya um, Medical Center. They are also on the field. Uh, they are doing research. They are active people. <laughs> so it's quite challenging for, for them. But uh, I think uh, towards the end of the course, they see the value of it. Okay, from the feedback that we received. The second thing that we did is that we still um, uh, conduct research. OK, if uh, for your information, EDEC has this UM Lighter grant, research grants for all academics in University of Malaya um, to research about the innovations in their own classrooms. So these grant management also be done online um, and we just recently um, completed uh, our light tech uh, conference virtual. So this is something that we have done um, at University of Malaya. Back to you, Aza. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah. The the light tech. Um, I I should I should mention that. Um, before the pandemic, we set the theme to be personalized learning without expecting that COVID-19 will be um, attacking us at the time. And suddenly um, COVID-19 happens and um, the grant proposals that was meant for on face-to-face um, -face classes somehow had to be changed. And that, that change mindset that we have from the, um, the center of um, Academic uh, Development Center, our ADEC, from the staff, from the, the the academicians, the the lecturers themselves, that has really helped us um, make it through. And somehow we just found that it's well. The title or the theme of the conference is personalized learning. We should just make it personalized learning in COVID nineteen pandemic. So that's somehow that I would really proud to I would proud to share that we were successful in. I could say that we could we were we were fortunate to be able to make that bridge between that um, um, non pandemic um, setting into a pandemic setting. So that's one of the examples I could share that that we, we found from from UM. Um, any any stories that you want to share with the Rose on uh, the attempts and the at, at the administration level at IIUM that the lecturers at the ground are feeling from the management. Would, would you like to share some of those? OK, sure. Um, as probably you would all have known, IIUM is one of the uh, latest universities to reopen um, after the lockdown. Because I think we start, we restarted classes in June, as opposed to other universities uh, that carried on online learning from April. Okay, um, hang on. Yes. All okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, interruptions are a new norm. So that's why. Uh, anyway, um, we were one of the latest because uh, we had uh, uh, the management of the university had a series of uh, meetings and they went on the ground to um, you know ask lecturers ask students so it was a 360 kind of uh, you know on the ground kind of survey research to see how uh, feasible is online learning for IIUM because we have always you know um, encouraged uh, personalized learning, but in the form of face to face, hands on community engagement and all that. So our students are all over the place. Uh, when this pandemic hit, uh, then IIUM had to pause a little bit and see what is the best uh, move forward. OK, uh, at the end of June, I believe, um, just as we were about to start, uh, the um, classes online again, uh, we came up with guidelines 
<clears throat> in the form of a booklet. So all lecturers uh, were given that. And there was series and series of trainings online, uh, whether it is on the pedagogy, whether it is on the tools, um, <clears throat> on the psychological well-being, everything, you name it. Um, the management, especially the center, Center for Professional Development has helped in uh, you know, disseminating more information about teaching online about this new whole Thing. Uh, so it is just up to the lecturers whether they want to take it or not, you know. Uh, so that's uh, the experience that I had was, you know, uh, being uh, an ex uh, e learning uh, person in IIUM who sort of uh, was kept very busy uh, on promoting online learning. I had a few phone calls, uh, you know, asking for advice, asking for help uh, on how to move further with online learning in IIUM. So Alhamdulillah, um, my input was there uh, even right up to our Tansri Rector uh, as well. So we had uh, email exchanges uh, so that things can be um, put in place and classes will be run smoothly. On top of that, our students, uh, our student union, IIUM student union, had a whole series of dialogues, forums. They went to see the uh, management uh, to tell what is actually going on on the ground and how can the management really help um, the students who are disadvantaged, right? I, I saw some questions there about disadvantaged students who don't have internet access and all that. Uh, and then uh, they came up with, you know, the suggestion to allow uh, students who do not have access to come back to campus and use the campus facilities with strict SOPs, of course, at that time. And that did happen. Uh, they did come back and uh, some students were using uh, the internet in the uh, in the mahala or in the dorms um, and that alhamdulillah helped a lot uh, because access to education should not be cut off uh, just because of a pandemic. Uh, it is up to everybody to sort of you know work our way through on how to mitigate this problem and we did uh, you know, as other universities as well, uh, they did talk to telcos, uh, you know, uh, service providers to give access to students uh, at an affordable rate and subsidized by the universities and all that. So uh, in terms of the management, what they have done is uh, a lot and I applaud them. Uh, it is just up to the lecturers and students whether they want to buy it or not, uh, whether they are on board, whether they want the learning to go on or not, because um, for me personally, learning cannot stop. Um, you know, like uh, the Prophet Salam has said once, um, ilm is like rain, it's like rain is like water. So if water's, uh, water's nature, if it cannot flow, in one direction, it will find its way to flow in another direction. So that's what ILM is all about. That's the nature of it. Therefore, if we can't deliver it face to face, there are many other means it's just that we have to, um, you know, find it. That's why we are here. That's why we are in our positions as academicians, as lecturers, is to figure out this whole thing um, because there are many avenues uh, that students can learn and it is our job to facilitate that learning process. So that's my sharing on uh, what our, uh, you know, our lecturers are feeling on the ground. I think the university has done a lot. Uh, it's just up to us. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Ros. I really like how you mentioned the, 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 the presence of the uh, student union as well in that loop where the administration at the very top level to the to the to the lecturers and the trainings you have and getting feedback right from the students at the ground and coming back up and that's a beautiful thing that's that's and and you had you had that that time with that you had um that you, because you launched your semester re relaunch your semester in in june you mentioned june july yeah i, I do i'm from UI, uia i'm i'm a, I'm a uia graduate and i do have good friends in UAE and I do realize that they, they talk about this. They talk about, um, you know, using, they have to practice using the, 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 the new tools in order for them to, 
to be very prepared for the class. So I can see that the training and and the movement is there. Maybe maybe um, at the uh, effective level, they are different from other people. Depend on it depends on how they would like to try it. But I I do see that they are talking about it. They're trying things out. And, and I, I really enjoy having that conversations with my friends in UIA as well. What about in UTEM? Um, what are the highlights that you would like to share that the initiative you have uh, from uh, UTEM's um, administration? Would you like to share that, Tazul? I think what um, Dr. Rosmiza said exactly happened in our universities, you know, is from the top down, is from bottom up, you know, and we try to find any mode of any solutions that we believe is it's is suitable at this stage even uh, we even suggesting that probably we can learn through like the normal one remember when we are young we learn through uh, apa, pembelajaran secara post adabi remember those kind of days where actually we learn english uh, you know by buying the books online with the tape recording and so on so even up to that stage actually we we are discussing so and if you're talking about what Dr. Rosmiza said, that is 100% what I believe other universities have been doing. It's exactly the same process. We try to find the best avenue. We try to find the best way of how this learning process needs to be delivered. It's not because of this pandemic that we have to stop learning. I, I think that's probably the the, the misunderstanding of um, of knowledge. Knowledge is just like what Dr. Smiza said. It's just like raining. You know, it, it goes everywhere. So uh, due to that, UTEM also doing exactly the same. You know, the the Persatuan Plaja, the Student Association, up to the Timbalan Naib Chancellor, uh, Har Ewa Plaja, up to the Timbalan Naib Chancellor Academy, even the NC itself, we are putting ourselves in the positions that uh, we try to make sure that everybody, our 11,000 over student will get exactly the same um, education as before. Now, what as Dr. Rosmiza said is correct, that now is up to the universities to do it. I, I cannot deny that at the end of the day, the technology, as I said, just a tool. We implement different kind of, of options. We give the lecturers different kind of options. We give the student different kind of option. Even up to the lowest tech, we call it the lowest tech, we call it WhatsApp and Telegram. Even even up to that stage, we, we try to communicate with the student. Because you know what? Um, when it comes to this kind of situation, sometimes we cannot look the technology as the solution alone you know sometimes we have to go back and sit down again and and probably the conventional way of doing posts you know learning through posts is also can be as an option so because of we have the student from Sabah and Sarawak, they, they live remotely, you know, we don't want them, you know, to, to be in the newspaper, they're climbing up the trees, you know, remember those issues and, you know, because just try to get the network. Now, the other things that actually we in UTEM is also with this pandemic, we, we've been given a blessing where actually we, you know, we, we've been given a chance actually to, to go back and sit down and look back at our facilities, you know, what actually we can improve in terms of our technology, in terms of our teaching aid, such as the future classroom, such as all the, the, uh, the LMS and also the exam portal. So within the period of less than six, Six month, uh, UTEM has um, improved a lot in terms of our learning management system, our Moodle. Um, we we grow from what we call it, you know, nasi tambah to become now. You know, if you don't have those uh, those those nasi, you know, you you're not going to survive. So and even the internet connectivity in the campus also being being um, being upgraded um, we provide also the virtual private network to our student because of it's like this when the student actually uh, study uh, from home uh, because online learning has become 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 a days anytime anywhere uh, you know the, being a technical university there's a certain application or certain software that actually the student can't afford to to own so the university need to provide those. So what we do actually, we uh, the Pusat computer or the computer center, we call it, we activated what we call it the virtual private network. We actually, the student will be able to access a certain software 
through the virtual private network. That software actually sit in within our campus, but the student will be able to access those uh, those uh, application and software through this virtual private network. We we go up to that stage, and we also improve our network connectivity. We 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 providing the student with actually we call it a data plan. That that's where actually you see make an initiative. But the other things actually what what is the most important that I always tell all the lecturers is like this. Yes, we try to make our classroom as interactive as we can. We try to make our classroom as effective as we can. But at the same time, you know, while developing uh, or curating the content through online, we also need to consider about the student ability to access to our LMS. Now, and that's where actually the instructional design is coming in and that's also actually the knowledge of the lecturer itself on the technical part that we need to put into consideration. Let me give an example of one simple thing. You know, even a telecommunication company, telecommunication provider, you know, even though they said that they are providing unlimited data and unlimited calls uh, for the price of only 30 ringgit a month, but this this various type of telecommunication company actually giving a slightly different speed, a different uh, catch, you know, how actually the network can be accessed. Uh, if we're talking about the telecommunication A, for example, they're providing six megabit per second for their data access, which is quite fast, but with the price of probably the tiering it. But the other telecommunication company also claim that they are providing unlimited access data to the uh, to, to uh, during the pandemic, but probably their bandwidth is only about three megabit per second. So three megabit per second and six megabit per second of data transmission is actually different. So if the student will, will you know, the student also need to understand that. So the lecturers also need to understand that. So not all. Not all the lecturers can be done through synchronized. Even in UTEM, we we encourage the lecturers to have um, a, a mix of between synchronized and, and asynchronized kind of uh, teaching delivery because uh, we have to, to cater for different kind of students. If you are doing a synchronized, but the student will not be able to, to listen to what you said because the line is breaking up, basically it's no point, isn't it? So the best way actually for the student is just to go through the learning process through a synchronized, where actually you can upload your pre-recorded recordings and then the student will be able to watch again and again and again. So this is what, what UTEM has been doing. You know, we, we're giving the lecturers a choice, you know, but we also at the same time um, telling the lecturers to, to be more wiser in choosing what type of technologies they're actually suitable for the student. If we're talking about the Pusat Bahasa, for example, their student is thousands of them for one particular course. So to run your courses through real-time webinar like this, it will definitely, you know, the, the bandwidth will not, not be able to, to cater for that kind of a number of students because of their student who start breaking up, they will not be able to listen to you. So the best way for this kind of a group of a large student, you need to do a, a synchronized learning process. But the a synchronized learning process also, there's a catch because of, you know, the student need to also understand how to learn independently, you know. So all the communications uh, happen at the back, you know, it's not in real time. So lecturers basically work until midnight sometimes or even until early in the morning because students sometimes will, will just send you a messages at three o'clock in the morning. But but this is the reality that actually learning is like that. So what UTEM did actually is we in PSTP especially, we providing them with the technologies, we product providing with various solutions, but it's up to the lecturers where which one actually is suitable for them. They have to analyze, they have to evaluate the effectiveness because we don't want one single a student actually will be left behind. So KAIS itself under Prof. Aiza, the, 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 the magnetic member, I, I believe every week Dr. Faiza is providing all these webinar training for the lecturers, you know, from the pedagogical part up to even, even this week. Today, actually, uh, or tomorrow, I guess, Dr. Faiza is also providing what we call it open book exam, how actually the lecturers will be able to design an open book exam. So uh, all this actually become what we call it the 360 degrees changes that actually need to be made by each of the lecturers. For me, the keyword is very simple. The technology just a tool, but the delivery of, of the knowledge can happen in any mode, right? In any way, um, the lecturers also need to be intelligently, um, what we call it, choose the right technologies. The university, being as a university, we're able to provide them with policies. We'll be able to, uh, to, to provide them with SOPs. 
and what the rest is actually belong to the lecturers. I, I always believe like this. The responsibility of learning must come back to the student when it's become online. And our responsibility, a responsibility as lecturers, being as lecturers, is to provide what we call it adequate um, uh, resources for the student to learn independently. So this is what you have been doing. Now, the challenge for you, Tam, actually is we are skill based kind of universities, right? Um, we have lectures for two hours and then we have another two hours for the lab base. So both of them actually is two different, uh, we call it set of curriculum that you need to cover. It's, it's not an option. If you have two hours lectures, then another two hours definitely is going to be your lab session. It's become a challenge because of, you know, if you're talking about the engineering courses, you know, the student need to go to the, the workshop, they need to handle certain machine, they need to handle a certain equipment and so on. But because of those privilege is no longer there, it doesn't mean that those particular section of learning need to be halted, need to be stopped. There's always a way that we can do it. Either we need to go through simulations, we have to develop our own simulation, or on the best actually, I always encourage my lecturers to look at whatever tools they actually they see in front of them. Now, if you look at the uh, these two major um, operating system in in the smart devices, um, such as the Google, uh, the Play Store and also the App Store, ninety percent or even eighty percent of all the apps actually is all about educational apps. If you don't believe it, we'll just sit down and just Google, uh, just search. And you will find that there's so many educational apps that actually can be very relevant to our courses. It might not be 100% relevant, but if it's 50% relevant to that particular courses, that will be good enough to be included into that. So simulation is part of the what we call it a keyword nowadays. Even some universities using, we call it the mixed reality, where actually the, the lecturers, you know, combining the augmented realities with virtual realities, with so on, you know, for, for them to learn. But again, adopting this kind of technology definitely will incur costs, you know, and we have to think again how to balance between costs and also the cost effectiveness. And we also need to balance between who can get access to that technologies and who actually unable to access the technologies. Because UTEM student actually is not like University Malaya student, right? You are the chosen university. We, our student is in a moderate level student and majority of them actually is from B40. So, you know, the support actually will, will be tremendous for this kind of student because some of the students, they not even have laptop at home, you know, so they're relying on their mobile phone. Luckily, in this era, actually now, smart devices is very cheap. It's not like 10 years ago. Nowadays, you can buy this uh, mid-range um, smart devices with a cost of probably 500 ringgit, which is for me, uh, Malaysia is among the cheapest country if you want to buy the smart devices. And I always encourage the lecturers and the students to at least invest in this kind of technology because of learning can can happen through all those devices. But we're talking about the managerial part, I think is exactly the same as uh, Dr. Rosmiza said. Um, from the top down, we from the bottom up, we, we, we try to cover the 360 degrees of, of um, in, uh, situations. We look at different perspective. Uh, we get feedback from our students, you know, how actually they're going to access the, 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 the online learning. And all this has been that I believe even University of Malaya itself is doing exactly the same. So we cannot deny that because of, you know, everybody is, is you know, the NC is also having their own meetings, the TNCA also having the meeting. So they have this one single word, you know, this problem cannot be seen just through from one perspective. It has to, you know, to see from a multi perspective. I, I guess everybody's exactly the same. Back to you. I, I completely agree with that. The the 360 degrees um, approach from all level is done by all universities. And I, I, I really, we would really like to applaud all the higher education management on, on us tackling this, um, this, this pandemic issue and online teaching and learning delivery uh, for our students. I'm, I'm sure we always put our students at the forefront of whatever decisions we make and um, I, I like your point about having uh, the labs and that becomes quite quite uh, 
a big a big has, um, hustle or a big a big boundary that you think or uh, that most of not you most of the lecturers will think that um, lab has to be done on um, face to face and, and you know especially when it comes to group it does not have to be just engineering students maybe students from other faculties as well they also have uh, the the learning situation where they need to have the interaction it's crucial to have that interaction maybe uh, from school of drama school of arts and, and uh, school of arts you know um, and um, maybe a little sharing from from my personal classroom where i do i do labs as well uh, and it's for uh, undergraduate students first year undergraduate students so these are the students who did not even have to come we didn't even request them to come to university but they are enrolled as um students we lecturers we produce lab kits and we post it to them to homes so it really reminds me when you mentioned the adabi <laughs> the adabi post you know the, the learning we we still do that you know uh, amazingly those that we find in the 80s we are doing it right now because if we find that is the best way that is the best way and we keep in touch with them through whatsapp whether they have received their lab, lab kits or not and um, we we encourage them to make use of what's in their garden what's in their kitchen you know so they use so i think with that they are able to internalize the concepts and the understanding a lot more compared to going to the labs because when they go to the lab the devices are set for them okay you put in this load you press this button you you record whatever number comes out there so sometimes that becomes a step back because they don't think of what's the reason behind because they they follow and then we as lecturers we are so used to okay this is your lab report it has to have this 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 this, this. so in the end students become robotized or mechanics the, the, very mechanical in nature but uh, when we have this this um situation we allow them to make mistakes we allow them to experiment with their bicycle wheels or their pulleys at home with their wheelbarrows or whatever they can use in their backyard in their own home and with the lab kit that we you know it's 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 until now i'm 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 still um, in all that i can relate a lot with the adobe post uh, thingy that we we prepare the lab kit and we we, we lecturers search or on lazada which is the <laughs> which is the best price for a multimeter you know things like that we, we we search and we do those things and we wrap nicely and send it to them and for those who did not receive it after three weeks somehow some way um staff academic staff and maybe the technical staff they went to the student's house and gave it by hand so those are the things that i really I, I i really would like to share with everyone that these are the things that um academicians or not only academicians but the support staff of the university or higher learning institution are actually doing above and beyond what they are what they are supposed to do in to just to ensure that the students are receiving what they should have you know the facilitation and the and the resources that you mentioned our role is to have that to provide that resources and the platform in order for them to learn um yeah so so thank you for pointing that out uh, dr zul um dr farah maybe i can i can ask uh, there's a question on the board on uh on the live event q a section from uh i don't know miss or mr or dr habibi i am observing some of my friends me too are quite stressed having the online teaching and learning it has been almost one year what makes them feel that is that sometimes if not most of the time their teachers or professors teach in a monotonous way there should be ways out to boost innovation and creativity among hei's faculty members during distance learning how is this attempt carried out in your institution maybe this is a good question for dr farah you want to put your insights in oh thank you dr aza uh, for the question um this question remind me of um what is our um what is our novel intention when we join the academia I think that everybody has to think again. What makes you, what or what inspire you to become a teacher or a lecturer in the first place? Um, 
I believe that everybody, whoever um, now and call professors or lecturers or even teachers, um, when we first started our career as academics, we wanted to, to share knowledge um, and skills with other people and we want to help them improve the conditions of the country um, or condition of the nation, even, even themselves. Uh, so these are the excitement um, and the noble intention that we still need to hold on. Um, I can say that uh, sometimes when we have worked for many, many years in the academia or in, in any career, sometimes the motivation, um, the noble intentions quite, you know, no longer there <laughs> and it needs some kind of boost, okay? Um, of course, there are so many factors that uh, contribute to the this situation. Uh, one of it may, may be because of the frustrations with the current system, um, the lack of facilities um, that we are so much uh, wanted to share with our students. But as Dr. Zul pointed out just now, um, it's, it's, the facilities are not now we can't use the facilities anymore and we have to change to others. So the academics are also stressed out trying to figure out their ways, how to reach the students. Uh, so they keep on upgrading themselves and this is a learning process. I think that uh, if I can point out to all my colleagues uh, who are now lecturers and also teachers, think of teaching as a helping profession. We want to use our knowledge and skills to help other people, especially our students, to improve so that the students can then contribute back to the society to make our country a good country, um, to upgrade whatever system, whatever flaws we have in the current systems um, and so on. So if we still think about that. Uh, we'll try to do our best. And I think that if we have that in our mindset, it will then translate to our behavior. Okay, we will change our roles from just being knowledge conveyor <laughs> to become a facilitator, as uh, we have discussed before. But then beyond that, we want to be motivator to our students and of course to be an inspiration for them. That will be uh, the highest level, I think, in the teaching <laughs> and learning processes. So um, another thing, uh, I think the practical thing that they can do is perhaps to reduce um, the quantity of materials that they want to deliver and focus more on the quality of the materials. So I think that um, we were in the very first phase of the MCO. We were rushing to introduce everything to our students. We want to try out a lot of things. We gave a lot of content to them and we asked them to do a lot of assessments or activities and they was like bogged <laughs> down. Okay, there are so many things for them uh, to focus on. Now that we are in the phase two, if I can say, we are now, now more settled, we know our ways. Try to think about how to deliver your content in a very uh, quality way. Add more interaction instead of just more content production, I think. Um, I would also want to point out that point number three is the importance of um, quality assurance in this teaching online. Uh, we have this quality assurance for so many times. All universities um, need to uh, follow the guidelines given by our um, central agencies um, and also internal um, rules. Uh, now the challenge is to to make sure that everything can then be translated online as well. So I think um, the students also can play a part by um, helping the lecturers know what are the flaws and what can be improved better. Uh, maybe the end of semester evaluation, don't call it end of semester evaluation instead, just end of semester reflections of the teaching and learning experience will be helpful for both the students and the teachers. Back to you, Azza. Thank you, Dr. Farah, for that for that nice description of, of the 
holistic way of looking at things. You started by asking the question, why are we joining the profession as the teachers or the educators or the lecturers? So that's a very important question, I think, and we should all try to address that in front of our mirror, our own very own mirrors. Yeah, thank you so much for that. We have one question from uh, from the floor. Maybe I would like to address it to Dr. Dr. Rose. Um, I believe that majority of the lecturers would feel that they are overloaded with the preparation for pre-recorded lectures as well as live session. This is, I'm not denying, it's a lot of pressure from all, uh, it, it's felt by a lot of lecturers, our, our own colleagues. So maybe you, you would like to address that, Dr. Rose? Okay. Uh, I like this question because I get this question a lot <laughs> when, uh, you know, when people do forums and stuff. You have to remember, face-to-face -face delivery is not the same as online delivery. What we have always been trying to do for the past six, seven, eight months is to replicate whatever we did face-to-face -face onto the online world which does not work, right? It does not necessarily mean that when we in class, we lecture for one hour, we need to produce a one hour recording of lecture. It does not necessarily mean when we are in class, we do group discussions um, and when we are online, we have to do the group discussion, no totally different design altogether, right, Dr. Zulisman, because he's a, a designer as well. You need to sit down again, look at your syllabus, look at your curriculum, and then decide which ones do you really, really, really need to record, and which ones can just be delivered through an infographic, a PowerPoint slide, or simply giving them an article, or simply asking them to read a chapter in the book. It is not a sin to ask your students to read the book. <laughs> they need to read the book. So, instead of you, lecturers, coming up with the teaching materials, your students can produce learning materials, right? That's what Dr. Zulisman was talking about. Transfer the responsibility of learning back to the students. What we have always been doing is we are doing the learning for the students and the students just sit there and Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So <laughs> the design, the, the secret is in the design. When you really master this design, instructional design concept, right, you will find that it is so much easier for you to plan your semester. OK, so instead of us having to record being overloaded and some of us are like, oh, no, I don't want to sit in front of the camera. I put 10 kilograms on my <laughs> on my face and stuff like that. Transfer that recording back to the students. It is not a sin. It's OK. Ask them to read the book. People don't read books now, you know. I asked my son, who's the, the 18 year old who sleeps during the lecture. Aren't you going to read? Uh, it's OK, the lecturer is going to record the lecture anyway. You see, you see, it's we are the ones who are taking away the books from them. OK, get them to read it. Um, I am actually doing online classes for smaller kids, for primary schoolers and for secondary schoolers, th th uh, teaching about critical and creative thinking. What they need to do before the class is they need to read. These are small kids. And they do read. And when we come into the online, uh, when we come to the live session, that's when the whole discussion debate goes on. See? So if we can get 10 year olds to read, we certainly can make 18, 19, 20 year olds to read. Because in order to get knowledge, you cannot discard that most, I would say, most uh, precious um resource which are the books right you and i both bo everybody lecturers penat kita tulis kan it's so it's not easy to write so we need somebody to read it make our students read yeah so therefore my solution 
for, for lecturers out there to this overburdening problem of creating content is transfer it back to the students. What about students who do not have access to internet? You know, they can't put it up on YouTube. What about them? They can always write. They can always manually write. They can type it into and print it nicely and mail it back to you. You know, um, if they have access to, to scanners or stuff like that, they can certainly post it online. You know, this is like an explosion of uh, content, of knowledge online as we speak. It, it's unprecedented. You know, before this is just people like Dr. Farah, Dr. Azar, Dr. Zulisman, the magnetic members, the MAPTA members who are like produce content online, produce content online. We want to, you know, disseminate our knowledge. It's just us. But now the gate has opened for everyone to do this. OK, so therefore the motivation for for me uh, especially to do this, I've been doing this even way before the pandemic. My students have been creating content uh, and that process helps them a lot in their uh, in in getting their learning outcomes. Can we always talk about OBEs and all that? But we are going against OBE by doing the learning for them. That's not OBE, okay? Uh, so we have to go back to the fundamentals. What is it that we want the students to achieve? What, right? Do we just want them to produce, uh, you know, facts on paper? Or do we really want them to be able to utilize this knowledge for the benefit of others? Uh, in other words, it's ilmu bermanfaat. So that's what we want to do. I hope that answers the question, uh, Dr. Azhar. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. The gate has opened, as you say. The gate has really opened and, and we do have the ticket to not give a three hour lecture. I think we lecturers are still afraid about the TE or the teaching assessment or in, in UN we call it C-test. What if I give too much work to the student? Now later the student will give me you know low marks for my teaching assessment. We are so scared. I don't know scared of what like Dr. Sulisman said. Um, we created that that rule and we are afraid of our own rule that we have created. So it's so funny that 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 we are trapped in that in that mindset so uh, i guess um i'm sure there are leaders out there who are listening to this that 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 uh, play the role of you know the key the key gate opener that that says it's okay like dr rosso it's not a sin to let the students uh, do stuff and we do have to understand that the students may have too much to do so it, it goes back to what Dr. Farah mentioned about quality and quantity. Just pick things that are meaningful to them in order for them to create the content on so that it becomes more of a quality thing rather than, you know, for the students to replicate everything. Instead of us, three hours, they do the three hours. So still back to square one. I mean, uh, we select what we are best, what the things that we are best to do and we pass on to the students what they are the ones who are best to do. So it's it's the art in the designing. So I'll get back to Dr. Zul about the there's a question on creative agents. So I I, I just saw your face there from uh, Dr. or Mr. Jonathan here. What are some things we can do to increase the excitement of lecturers to become the creative agents who will excite students in turn? Dr. Zul, your, your, your insights, please. Okay, um, I, I did answer that a bit. Now, um, as I, I want to have this extension from Dr. Farah and also Dr. Rosmiza. This is a very good thing. Yes, please. You, you know, when we're talking about uh, learning independently, you know, uh, what we are missing so far all these years, what we've been missing actually is giving an experiential learning to the students because of, as what Dr. Rosmiza said, we, we keep giving them, like a spoon feeding them. But experiential learning is actually is the best way to give an excitement to the student to learn. Um, experiential learning means actually, for example, I give you one example, right? Very simple. This particular student probably taking mechanical engineering, uh, automotive. Now, usually what we do actually, we show them the engine, V6 engine, for example, in the lab, right? We have this one big car. Now you're, you, you're not allowed to do that because of, you know, you're not allowed to come to the campus. You're not allowed to come back there. But your fathers have a car. <laughs> right? Why don't you open, you know, ask your father, can I open the booth of your car and I want to see the engine. Now, 
learning through experience, you're seeing yourself using your father's car. What type of engine that your car's your father's own? Does it Mercedes car? What engine that Mercedes car's own? What does the Volvo's car's engine own? Take a photos, take a videos, come out with your own creative way on reporting those kind of things. Give them excitement of doing things. I remember when I was young, you know, I don't have privilege of buying toys. You know what I do? You know, I have this, uh, what we call it, this uh, back hole, you call it, jentra, jen, jentola, we, 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 you know, ambil tanah, do all those things. We using, you know what, sardine tin, you know, that thin sardine tin, we use that and then we make it and then we can all those kind of things. So, but our students missing those kind of creativity because of we suppress those creativity back. But in this pandemic, that is actually the learning that needs to come back. It's not only about the technology, but it's about everything that they have around their house. The mother's pinggan, their mother's sudus, you know, <laughs> kain baju mak tak pakai, you know, the bicycle that you never been used for many years, sitting down there and lying down there. All this actually is the designing of what Dr. Rosmiza said. You have to design the curriculum back, see which content on those particular sections that requires the student to be in experiential learning. Ask them, for example, find anything that you feel just like a wheel, for example. Okay, I don't have a bicycle at home. I don't have a motorbike at home. But my father does have a spare tires. One. Okay, take that spare tires, ask the fathers, can I use your spare tires? I want to create something out of it, for example. So this experiential learning actually is something that bring the student into experience of what they've been learning. Skill-based learning or any, any type of learning actually requires experience, right? You must give them the environment where they have to be very creative. So... It doesn't matter how high tech you are in, in this era, you know, you, you holding smartphone. You know what? The student willing to go back, they make a U-turn, even though they're already at the front of the gate because of they forgot their smartphone, right? <laughs> but, but our student nowadays, if their tire of the car is punctured, they can tell you that they cannot attend the class because they are not creative. For them, when the tire car is punctured, that's it. Right, I don't have to attend the class. So this is actually the learning process that we have been embedding into their mindset for all many years. We never give our student a chance to be creative person, to be an innovative person. So experiential learning, the keyword is experiential learning. Learning through experience is more important. One, you must use whatever you have. It's like what we call it, uh, upper, um, uh, self sustainabilities. Right, that is very important. Now, during the MCO, actually, everybody must talk about self sustainability. What happened if one day this COVID nineteen become bigger than what we expected, and the learning process is not going to happen in the in the in the university? University will going to be deserted. Everything is can you cannot move around within the compound of your house. What are you going to do? Are you going to stop from learning? You can't. So whatever you have around your house can be as a learning tools. So the only thing that we need to tell the student is to facilitate those experiential learning process. So if, for example, today you want to see the V6 engine, for example, and the student does not have V6 engine, they just can open the V, uh, you know, V12 engine of their father's car and telling them what's the difference of them. Ask them to create, as what Dr. Rosmiza said, let the student presenting it in the way that they love presenting. Presenting it. Some students, you know what, they love visual. They like to present the idea, the assignment through visual. They want to become like a TV host. Let it be. Some students, they don't like to, to, to show their face on, on TV or on, on video. They want to write it down. Ask them to write it down because we don't actually assess the tools that they're going to present. What we assess them actually is the learning outcome, the outcome from what they understand from the learning process. So, we as a lecturers, as I mentioned earlier, we need to become a creator ourselves. We have to be creative in ourselves, within ourselves. That's only we can pass that creativity back to the student. Hey, you know, if I can do it, you will be able to do it. I, I love what Dr. Rosmiza and Dr. Faradina said. You don't give students thousands of assignments. You just give them one single assignment in one day, but you give them ample time for them to give you more, you know. So let's say, you know, you ask them to watch a simple, uh, to read simple article as Dr. Rosmiza said. But from that simple article, you want them to transfer those to become something visual or something tangible. 
All right, so it can be done. Mathematics, when we teach mathematics in the university, we should not teach mathematics like the way how we teach mathematics at school. It should, it's supposed to be applied mathematics. With this set of equation, how, what, uh, uh, what output you can came out from. So those kind of things. English, learning bahasa, for example. You want to teach student Mandarin. In class, you tell the student how to pronounce. You're going to see their mouth, what they speak. Now tell them, okay, I want you to come out with a music note, you know, sing a song, you know, but translate this set of lyrics of English to, to Chinese, to Mandarin language, for example. So you are actually encouraging the student to be more creative. So I encourage all the academicians here today is to transform yourself from being as a lecturer who only know how to giving lectures in front of the student to the someone that actually become an inspiring person like what Dr. Faradina said. You must inspire your student. You know, a good teacher teach, a great teacher inspire. Go back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zul. Very nicely put. We we talk about, about how our role and, and what we should do, but it's very important to realize that we are the audience or the target group that we are talking about are the students. It's very important for us lecturers to or educators to understand them a little bit more. There's a question on, on this about uh, from, I don't know, Dr. Rohana maybe. With this new teaching and learning method, the teaching evaluation criteria or elements need to be changed accordingly. That was the question. I mean, the CTES. My personal take on this is I had my very own student who says, Doctor, kalau kita dah suka doctor, tanyalah apa dekat si test tu. Kita jawab lima je semua, you know. Uh, let, let, me, let me translate that for those who couldn't understand my yeah, bahasa Melayu. The, the, the point was, if the students like you, they understand what you thought, they get what you try to deliver and they, are, they, they realize that they are able to do what you have tried to deliver, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the score the, the, the teaching assessment elements in there, if they like you, they'll just put a five, 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 or full marks for all, you know. That's the message that my, that I get directly from my student about, about all these C-tests. Lecturers like Dr. Aisha say, C-tests to I pun takut, <laughs> you know. The, the, it's about us understanding the student and, and be buddies with them and, and get and, and, and connect it, connect with them that if they feel that they, they, they get it, they will acknowledge and all the other elements in the in the you know teaching assessment uh, items will just be items you know for them but but if they are they are you know so so with you then they'll be a bit more critical lah, i think they'll be a bit more critical okay this lecturer like this like this but but if, if you're a good one if, if you if you get them if you get them involved with you and the teaching sampai you know that the delivery is is there and they, they realize that they can do it i'm sure um it's not hard to score a good um, teaching assessment element what do you think about that dr farah about understanding the student and maybe you want to share something that um has has done on gauging what the students like and uh, what works for the student. Dr. Farah, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Azra, uh, for sharing the question. And it's a very good question. Um, and I think it is something that most of us academics are quite worried about or concerned about, <laughs> not, not so afraid of, but uh, worried about concern. I think um, not because we are afraid of the students or, or the implications, but we are worried that we are not delivering our best to our students and they are not getting it. Um, let me um, perhaps uh, share three things with you. Um, first, that I think the focus of the evaluation criteria need to change as well. Okay? Um, instead of uh, usually or previously we focus on the performance, of our students, okay, uh, we have now to change to the process of teaching and learning. So, if we think about the process, okay, the, the criteria will um, automatically will change the behavior or the, the teaching approaches that the lecturers use for the students. For example, instead of um, asking um, the students to evaluate the lecturers uh, teaching uh, delivery, 
maybe you can say what can be improved for the lecturers. So if we the students are able to share um, their thinking, we can then um, allow the lecturers to improve their teaching practices, right? This is what we have focused on um, in University Malaya. We try to change uh, from product oriented or performance based uh, seat test or teaching evaluation into a process based uh, evaluation. So we wanted to hear feedback from our students so that we can improve ourselves in the next semester. Um, the second thing is that I think when we have new teaching criteria or oh, sorry, the teaching evaluation criteria, these need to be communicated upfront to the lecturers so that they know okay, uh, what kind of assessment they are going to be assessed on. Okay, I don't like to use the word assessment or assessed on, but um, to make it easier for us to understand. Uh, so if you tell them upfront that these are the five things that the students will look into, perhaps the lecturer can plan accordingly. Oh, I am uh, being assessed on or being um, observed on how I interact with the students, how I engage with the students. So it should translate into um, a, a practice where the teacher or the lecturer will find suitable elves or suitable methods to make the students more engaged with the activity. And this will benefit both the teachers and also the students. Um, another thing that I would like to share is that think of CTES or teaching evaluation more as a reflective tool to reflect on our teaching and learning and not to make it as a punishment tool uh, or yearly performance based tool. Uh, if we can change that, um, it will be great for both the teachers and also the students. So Taza, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Zul. Uh, what do you think works best for the students? You mentioned about your uh, the students are B40. I mean, I think most of university awam students are B40. Most of them, even UM students, are uh, majority of them. When we when we got when we see the background, they are B40. So, but but yeah, we are. They come from a system that's in a certain way and. And we we somehow have to address that and and at the same time uh, induce the change in them. What do you think um, works best for them, Dr. Zul? Yeah, um, you know this this kind of you know the what we what we facing in in our country is actually that um, this group of students actually still considered as majority of of our student in the public universities. And uh, you, the challenge that actually we want to um, uh, to to deal with them actually is one. You know, some of them even actually they're not even seeing computers in it throughout their life and and all those. And you know, handling equipments and technology is not something that actually they are mastered with. Um, that's why you know sometimes you know in in certain university even you know for them to produce uh, some some work they need to master certain softwares, but. You know, when when this pandemic came in, you know, I I do not believe that actually we have to burden again the student to, you know, to invest in in any technological equipments which actually beyond their, you know, their um, uh, capacities and beyond their need. But as I said, mentioned just now, the lecturers need to be very creative in transforming the 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 content of the teaching delivery into something else. Um, as I said, you know, I think Prof Karim also been practicing this kind of method where actually you can use a very low tech kind of a way of, of communicating and dealing with this kind of student. And if I talk about the low tech, I can see WhatsApp and Telegram is considered as a very low tech kind of tools. Uh, now, even though these students are B40, yes, usually they will have these uh, mobile devices because of the mobile devices can can be um, bought in a in a very uh, affordable way nowadays. Now, no, 300 ringgit, 400 ringgit, I, I believe they will be able to, to can afford to buy that rather than buying this uh, laptop, which costs about probably three or four thousand ringgit. So now let me take this. This smartphone right, that, that we hold in our hand all this while, 
right? Actually, this is a supercomputers about 20 years ago. Why I call them is a supercomputers. Now, you know what? Even us as an adult, you know, the maximum um, utilizations of our smart devices is only making a call, checking Instagram, checking Facebook, and also taking a photos. That's it. But actually, these devices that already exist since 1994, I remember when the GSM telephone has been introduced in, in this country. And in 90, uh, early 2000, actually, the smartphone has become a, a, what we call a smart devices. This is actually a supercomputers, which is 20, 000, uh, 20 years ago, is as big as our, our office room. It's a mainframe, but now this is actually it's a supercomputers. We add the cost at the fraction of those costs, which is previously cost you about 100,000 over and now cost you about 500 ringgit. So uh, that's why we, we encourage the lecturers to be creative and, and the student also need to be creative in using this. That's why in, in our universities, we encourage the student to maximize using these devices to communicate and also to, to go through the learning process using their smart devices. Now, I give an example of simple thing. When I'm teaching the student face to face previously, I don't bring my laptop into the class. I don't bring my tablet. I just bring my phone. As long as my phone can be mirrored through, I will be able to, to, to go through with the student. Now, when we're talking about um, software, which the student aren't of, can't afford to buy, we have so many open source kind of software, we call it. Now, open source software actually is being developed by a group of people who are willing to develop this and they're giving free. Now, universities usually don't use this kind of open source application and software very much because of, you know, it's, it's being developed by the public people and, and it, it goes through a lot of development all the time. But actually, it, it as good as actually the, the mainstream software that, that the student can use. So the student do not need to buy anything. Now, so in UTEM, you know, we try to encourage also the lecturers not to use a proprietary software because the proprietary software will cost a lot. Nowadays, you know, sometimes the licensing for this software will cost hundred, or, you know, it can reach millions sometimes a year to subscribe. So the best way is actually to encourage the lecturers and the student to go for an open source kind of application and software because you can download it for free through your mobile and smartphone devices. So, you know, now, there's also another tools that actually we can use. The low tech tool like the Telegram, probably not so much on WhatsApp, but if everybody know how this Telegram work, actually it's, it works wonder for this B40 who probably do not have access to uh, faster bandwidth and so on. You can create folders, you can create materials in telegrams, you can assign tasks to certain students, and you can make these kind of uh, devices work for them just using their smart devices. Yes, you know, there is a certain courses that probably will, will, will lack a bit of what we call it hands-on, you're talking about the medical courses where students need to do a clinical things, you know, they need to see the corpse, they have to do, but there's certain apps that actually we can embed it into our curriculum. Now, as I mentioned here, in UTEM, we, at the moment, we are in the process of collecting all these apps that actually will be suitable for the student and also the lecturers need to be used. And whether it's from the engineering or non-engineering lecturers, because of this app actually you don't need to develop. You know, in this pandemic, we don't have time to develop. The pandemic came just like Taufan, just like reboot, can just came like that. And actually, COVID-19 just at the small tips of the iceberg, right? Next year, we might have what we call it a great recession. Because of the pandemic, COVID-19, the Great Recession is coming back, just like in 1930s, where the Great Recession coming back, nobody can buy anything, money is no longer valuable, you know, where, you know, things has to become back to become a manual, um, universities cutting down all the resources, you know, um, um, salary has been cut down, a lot of people losing jobs, you know, income has become very less. So we have to work with a, what I call it, a very low equipment that we can help this B40. As I said just now, the lecturers cannot always think that if I don't have this equipment, I cannot run the class. I think that mentality needs to be removed. Once the lecturer be able to remove that mentality, then your student in the B40, they will start thinking of, oh, actually I can do exactly the same as my lecturer did. Because I believe in this. 
we as a facilitators, we are the role model. If we keep showing the student saying that you cannot do this if you don't have this equipment, the student also will come back to us, sir, I cannot do this because I don't have this equipment. But if you keep telling the student, you can do this without this equipment, the student will start thinking more, they start thinking creatively, they start become a problem solver, they become more creative. I tell you the truth, even though you just give them a piece of wire, they will be able to create a marvelous thing from that wire if we tell them that that wire can create a lot of things out of it. So this B40 student actually, right, um, even in UTEM, if we look at this B40 student, actually they are tend to be more resilient. Uh, you, we have to believe on that because of they they born in 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 the in the situation where actually they're not being spoon fed it. They have to find their own ways to to solve certain problem. But we need to incalculate that back. We have to we have to take all this creativity back from them. You do not suppress this B40. What we do actually when we are in the class, usually what we do is we try to puko rata. We call it. We try to make all the students exactly the same. You know, that's why we believe that, you know, the student, when we come into our class 60 out of them, we tell them everybody is the same. No, actually the B40 students are more resilient than the one who born from the from the urban area because of they never been spoon fed with certain things. Sometimes they have to what? Makan pucu ubi, they can create a lot of different things. But for us as in the urban area, our students do not know how to cook even nasi. They do not know how to cook even uh up the low the low though but the the b40 student they they being taught with this in at home so so make make use that you know um and always believe that our you know in utem you know uh, this is probably for utem i guess probably not for others I, I want to to encourage all my colleagues here we have a lot of b40 student in utem believe me that this student actually more creative than us what you need from them actually just to chungkil sedikit saja their creativity Take it out from them, ask them to do some marvelous thing, they will produce, you know, wonders. That's that's what you do. So do not underestimate the B40, even though they do not have the technologies, they do not have the access to the internet and bandwidth, but they are more resilient in these kind of situations. They can survive better and they should become a role model. Make them as a role model to the rest of the other group of the student that being uh, unfortunate with the technologies, I will be able to produce exactly the same as the one that actually own these kind of devices. So, as I mentioned earlier, devices just a tool. If you do not know how to use the tool, you also will not be able to produce anything. So, might as well you don't have anything at all in front of you, then you start thinking of how I'm going to survive. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Zul. That's a beautiful and wonderful uh, realization that they are more resilient than we thought and with that in mind i think we we should be more prepared to 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 uh, design and to to be creative about and give them the opportunity and the chance to prove themselves and uh, I, I think it's 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 human nature dr rose i'll get to you about that human nature among the students it's human nature when you are, you, when you need to survive, you know, you push them into the lake or into the sea, they will swim. So the ones who know about life jacket and they will ask, where's my life jacket? Where's my this? Where's my that? But the ones who do, who do, who do not have any idea about what a life jacket is, they will survive because you just push them in and they will try to swim back up. So Dr. Rose, about human nature and our students, what, what's your take on on, oh, Dr. Rose, is, is she there? Oh, Dr. Rose is not there. Okay, Dr. Farah, what do you think about uh, the students and the, 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 the human part of students about uh, being resilient, being um, resourceful and their background? Um, we have Satu students, the ones who can pay for the fees to, to, to get into UM. We have the international students, we have the local students, and these are all um, all the students uh, are in our class as a big melting pot. But what are the key features that that we should look out for and we should identify and and, and try to to brush up about our students that 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 we should think about when we design or when we think about our learning teaching and learning delivery. Dr. Farah, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Azza, for the question. Um, I think that we need to uh, really think. Uh, of our students 
as human, <laughs> um, meaning that celebrate the differences of our students, celebrate their knowledge, their skills, and their life experiences. They are not coming to our class like an empty can. They do have something. Um, they are working adults or they have some kind of life experiences that are different from us. So if we can uh, acknowledge that and we can give them um, a chance to share their life experiences, um, it is something that they will treasure. You know, um, Eastern students have always been said or labeled as so passive learners. Okay, you are not so vocal. Uh, they are very shy. They don't like to ask questions. They just listen and absorb. Okay, while the Western students are being said to be vocal, they are very active learners. They are sometimes producers of knowledge. So how do we want to instill this in among our students in Malaysia? I think this is possible if we can nurture the environment, make the environment more inviting make them feel belonging to the class. Um, and I would like to also share um, the, the, the term, take your, take your students as co-designers of your course, if you can, okay? Take the challenge, make them as co-designers of your course, meaning that ask them about their perspectives um, in the design of their learning experience. They are the one who is going to go through all the learning materials or the learning um, path that we have paved for them earlier. Why not ask them whether that works with them uh, or uh, allow some flexibilities uh, on the go as long as you can achieve your CLO or the course learning outcome. I think that should be okay. Thank you, Dr. Farah. I actually get that, that, that advice firsthand from Dr. Farah a few semesters back when uh, in the middle of the semester, I gave out my own feedback form, Google, Google online uh, survey form among my students. What did you like most about my, my lecture? What works, what didn't work? And I got a lot of negative feedback. These are first year students and at that time, I was, it was the first time me teaching first year students. I was so used to teaching third year and fourth year where they are more mature and I could just throw things to them and they will get back to me. But when I use that strategy with first year students who just got into university and they're so used to STPM, SPM matriculation where everything is so, you know, prepared for them. And when you see Dr. Azar giving them a pass without, you know, without properly, you know, telling them what to do. And I got a lot of negative points. So Dr. Azar should have done this, you know, use, so I, I got so shocked. So I I expressed my concern to Dr. Farah and the take home message I got and, and I truly thank Dr. Farah for that was uh, just involve them in the decision making process the next time. If you want to give them a test or an assignment, ask them first, would you like it this way or that way? So that, that, that simple advice you gave Dr. Farah and I practice it in class. I did not have to do a lot of change. I actually have the, the 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 idea already, but I put it out there and I give them a chance to say, do you agree or do you not agree? Even that small change, I realized after that, oh, Dr. Azar is the best, oh, <laughs> you know, that, that participation that we get from them, even though you don't have to give them big assignments, you know, that involvement that they feel that that sense of belonging. So I really truly believe in that. So that's also human nature that we have to understand about our students. Dr. Farah, uh, Dr. Rose, uh, that was the question I would like to propose to you just now before you suddenly turn log out. Um, what was the what was the key um, features of our student that we should understand really in order for us to design effectively our learning learning strategy or our learning um, environment, Dr. Rose? What is it about our students that we have to know? Thank you. What is it about our students that we need to know? They are all different, definitely. And uh, they are not in the same lecture hall anymore. Uh, although we think of the ideal situation that uh, Dr. Judisman um, mentioned, they can use things around the house and all that. Those things are different now. We don't know what's in their house. 
Okay. And um, like you, Dr. Azza mentioned, first year, second year, third year students, fourth year, totally different. Um, and we have to, you know, it's not easy being a lecturer. Nobody says that uh, being in the teaching profession is actually a breather for women, especially. It's more burdensome. Uh, it's like being a mother to like hundreds and hundreds of students at the same time and the ones that we have to take care of home. What we need to understand with these students are, at least they are there, you know, they are enrolled. They want to learn somehow and they chose to be there, okay? Uh, no matter how much they say, oh, they have to enroll in your class, they have to be there, they are forced. They are not. They made the decision to be in your class. When a person made that decision to, yes, I am going to register for this course, I'm going to go through it, whether it is online or not, it is a choice that they make and we as lecturers, we have to respect that choice. How do we respect it? It's by giving them our all, giving them our best. Yeah, when we when uh, in the beginning we talked about personalized learning. This is the time when personalized learning is like it should be at everybody's fingertips. We have to address individual needs, whether we like it or not, OK? We cannot treat them like uh, Dr. Zhu says, one size fits all, that no longer works. Whatever was theorized with personalized learning, individualized learning has now uh, become a necessity. It's like air. We cannot breathe without personalized learning. With that, to understand each and every student takes time, right? And we have to allow for that process to happen. When we look at our syllabus, our curriculum, we know it's a lot to cover. This is the time, you know, that we uh, put our foot where our mouth is. We have been talking about uh, don't cover the content, but uncover it, discover it. This is when it needs to happen. It's right now because nobody knows what is ideal at this particular point of time. It is time to experiment. It's time to do whatever that we have never been done before. We don't know if it works. We don't know if it doesn't work. This is the time where we need to get to know the students individually. We can afford to do that because we have WhatsApp, we have Telegram at the very least. At the very least, we can individually text our students. Nobody says it's easy. That's what I can tell you. You cannot come back to me. How can I text all 200 of my students? I have to ask you that question. You do it first and you tell me whether that works or not. At that level, if you are willing to go to that level, that means I really salute you, I applaud you and whatever that you are doing will definitely impact the students. If it is not the content that they master, it is your passion, your inspiration that they will embrace. That's what we want. We want this kind of people to live in Malaysia. We do not want a person who lives here who is selfish. It is this time, at this point of time, lecturers need need to be selfless. We sacrifice a lot of things even before the pandemic, right? At least right now we get to be at home. We don't have to go to the campus to, to log in to teach. We can just log in from home. That's already an advantage. And we can work till late at night when our kids are sleeping, when before this, you know, those hours are not even counted. I'm sorry. Okay. And um, like I said, to understand the students, the best way is for us to communicate with them. Even a simple, how are you doing today? It's fine. They're like, eh, my lecturer texted me. You know, they feel obligated. They feel, they actually feel honored because we acknowledge their existence. When before this, when they are in the lecture hall, we don't even know their name. 
until the end of the semester, we mark their papers. Who is this guy? You know, and worse still, when we mark the final exam papers, it's just their metric number in there. We don't even know who writes those things. This is the time for us to get human. You know, this pandemic allows us to be human, to be in touch with our human side. Can we just go away? Okay. And um, yeah, <laughs> to get to know the students, I have no shortcut to that. There is no shortcut. But for us to reach out, if they don't respond, then that is a finding in itself. You know, when we do research, when we don't get any feedback, that is a finding. Uh, when they reach out to us a lot, that is another finding. And we know the characteristics of the students and all that, and then we will be able to adjust our teaching towards that. This is the time when we do not worry if we don't finish the syllabus as in, you know, ah, oh, there's so much. We need to identify which parts of the syllabus are must knows. And we need to identify which are the ones which are good to know. What I have observed uh, throughout the eight years I'm in academia is that we lecturers, we tend to talk a lot about the good to knows. We forget to emphasize on the must know and uh, that takes a lot of time from our teaching hours. That's why our students get disengaged. Yeah, when people ask me, you know, how to teach online, you can be effective even when you story tell, when you don't even use all of this Mentimeter, whatever gadgets. You can just simply be yourself and do story time and you yet yeah, you can be so engaging. Yeah. If you all know our uh, prof uh, Dato, Dr. Asma, the ex VC of USM who is now in uh, MQA. You can listen to her for three hours and you're just like that and you just wait that is she going to continue? Is she going to continue? You know, so you can just totally become a sage all together. Story tell the whole way. But some of us needs to have those breaks. We can't have that. We cannot afford to be a sage. We need to instruct at a certain point of time. To do that, we need to know the level of engagement from our students. And again, there's no shortcut. We need to collect those data, which is, you know, just simply communicate, give them Google Forms, um, just WhatsApp. How are you today? See who responds, who gives stickers, who does not respond at all, um, who talks a lot. Use students who, uh, you know, who are active in getting to know the rest of the students. OK, uh, one comment from my son, the 18 year old, uh, you know, foundation student. He says it is so difficult to make friends online. Of course, uh, you know, there's this one day uh, he went to his newly found friend um, online uh, in the same class went to his house to deliver something. And then when, uh, this guy, uh, he said online, he's so like, you know, uh, re responsive chats, you know, talks a lot and all that. But when he met the guy personally, he said, you know, Ma, how he was, how? Hi. He didn't even look at me. He's like, hi. So shy. But online is like, oh, so banyak benda lah dia nak cakap kan. Uh, yeah, so those kinds of personalities we see uh, in this, you know, in this era right now, post COVID. Jadi, looking at uh, my son first hand feedback, this is what a first year or a foundation student looks like. I mean, the lecturers really need to, I don't know, sacrifice ourselves. And I think at this point of time, um, when we talk about e evaluation just now, definitely it needs to change, it needs to adapt because nobody knows what's ideal anymore, like I said. Uh, and uh, like Dr. Azza's question is to get to know the students is it takes time. Uh, one whole semester is not enough, probably, but that's OK. That's OK. At least we are trying and we're getting there and get all of this published. I think that's what my um, advice is 
for any field that you are in out there, be it engineering, education, law, um, you know, medicine, whatever. This is the time to publish on teaching and learning and discover this whole new dimension that, you know, was sort of a blessing to us because this is the time when we get to learn new things. OK, yeah. I, I, I like what you say about try it out. You don't know if it works, but you also don't know if it does not work. So there's no harm in trying and no one will judge you for for trying and they will just appreciate you more just for trying. Yeah, so we are reaching towards the end of our webinar. <clears throat> it's 11.54 on my clock now. We promise to end at 12. Um, maybe I can take one last question from the floor. And for, for those who are uh, enrolled in the in this webinar, just uh, 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 an announcement that you will get your digital certificate for joining this webinar after you've answered the uh, online survey form or feedback form about this webinar at the end of the session. Our organizer will post that on the on the discussion, uh, the live event Q&A section on, on your right hand side of the screen. So you wait for that and uh, you will have some time to to answer the, the feedback form in order for us to improve on our next session and also for you to get your digital certificate from Magnetic, signed by the uh, Magnetic President uh, herself. So that last question I would like to uh, pass to all the our panelists today from AKA or should I mention ARCA, I don't know. How do we change the mindset of the students with the new culture of learning? How do we enculturate them to be more self-directed or self-regulated? So the, the key point here, maybe, maybe just two points or two sentences uh, each from Dr. Zul, Dr. Farah and Dr. Rose, how, to we, how do we enculturate them, the students, to be more self-directed or self-regulated? Dr. Zul, you want to start? Uh, I will just tell my student that learning is anytime, anywhere, 24 hours, 7 days a week, 365 a day. Learning doesn't mean that you have to attend the class. It can be from anywhere that you are belongs to. Uh, if you belong to the societies, you can learn through that. And that's it, you know, you, you don't have to meet me to, to start to learn with me, you know, you, <laughs> because of the technology is there. So the last word from me is that the day when the teachers stop learning, that is the day when the nation start to collapse. Thank you. Ara, how do we address that last question? Do we, how do we make the students more self-directed or self-regulated, Dr. Uh, thank you, Aza. I think that um, First, we um, acknowledge the students' potential that they can do it okay, and keep on motivating them and be with them uh, in the process of figuring out how to do it. Uh, a second, I think that we also need to teach them or guide them on how to be self-regulated learners. These skills cannot just come you know, immediately or they are not some people, they are not born naturally born with that skills they need to be taught okay so you need to tell them how they can be independent learners um, for example uh, what should be their routine uh, what should they do in this first um, uh, some first weeks of the semester and what should they do um, until the end once you have started um, the guide um, slowly you don't have to keep on guiding them or holding their hands. They will be slowly independent learners. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farah. What about Dr. Rose? Your last words about making our students independent learners? This is where I bring in um, the UIA uh, signature. <laughs> um, how I always encourage my students. The world starts with knowledge. When Allah created Adam, alayhi salam, the first man on earth, he taught him names. What are names? Names of everything. So what is a name? A name is knowledge. When you can name something, that means 
you understand the concept and everything behind it. And it is with this knowledge that is why all the other makhluk have to bow down to Adam. Therefore, the person with knowledge is glorified. You can never go wrong with knowledge. To encourage students to keep on learning, even though at the toughest of times, is to give them a sense of purpose for that piece of knowledge. Without knowledge, we are no better than the robot. Might as well the robot takes over the world because they do not have emotions. They cannot get pregnant and take three months leave. They are easier to handle. If they are broken, you can just throw them away. So what sets us apart from robots? It's knowledge. You made the choice to be here, to be with me in this class, in this forum, in this whatever. You made the choice, not me. Nobody put the gun in your head saying that if you don't attend this class, I'm going to shoot you. Even if somebody did put the gun at your head and say you have to attend this class and learn it, you are left with many choices. Number one, you can let yourself be shot. Number two, you can just hit the hand of the person and take over the gun. Number three, you can pretend to be dead. Number four, you don't have to be there at all. You are left with so many choices. How to make those choices is with knowledge. What knowledge? It is what you choose to take right now at this particular point of time. You choose to be in my class. Therefore, you choose to be the best you can be in this class. If not, then definitely, good luck to you, the robot is going to sit in your position at this point of time because I don't have to deal with all of your PMSs. See? So that's how I address my students. And uh, definitely, I don't get any late assignments. I don't get any complaints when I give them the robot because I have put in the head it is your choice. You choose to take this. I did not force you. You choose. You want the A, you want the B, you want the fail, you want to pass, you want to go beyond. It's up to you. It's your choice. And we have seen that the students really take charge of what they are learning. And we see quality and we see commitment, inshallah. But we lecturers first have to make that choice first. Why am I here? I choose to teach this course, even though we say I don't like this course, but they just assign it to me. But you chose to, to teach it anyway. Anything, it is our choice. So I would like to leave all of you with that and all the best to everyone in this pandemic. And it's an exciting new world. So I hope you find that excitement and joy together with all the challenges. I think we can really be successful in making our students, uh, you know, uh, have fun in our classes and take something home, inshallah. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose, for that uh, concluding remark. It's it's a wonderful um, closing, a wonderful closing sentence for our webinar. I would like to thank all the panelists, and I would like to really apologize to all the uh, audience who uh, wrote in their questions or their addresses that that we are unable to answer. Some of them, the panelists have kindly answered on the chat section itself, on the live event Q&A section itself. Uh, some of you mentioned about rewards, about um, uh, uncovering the content, about uh, CTES, and a lot of a lot of things are discussed outside of the, the webinar that we are, the, 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 the oral session that we are having right now. So I thank you so much for for all those uh, input and I can feel the audience right in front of us wanting to know more and are really interested to to learn more and, and gaining from from us all. I think uh, on the topic of teaching and learning delivery itself, it is the the number one um, issue that we have to address before we talk about assessment and participation and all of the other things. It's because learning as much as we say the learning is on the student's uh, role or responsibility, it's our responsibility first to set the tone for them. 
be an example for them. So it's uh, teaching and learning delivery is uh, it's very timely that we talk about this um, in the beginning of the semester right now. We are still week three, week four. We are still we still have room or time to change and improve our own practices. So I I, I believe that uh, we have all learned a lot from all the panelists. I, I would like to thank every single uh, one of you, Dr. Faradina, Dr. Rose, Maliza, Dr. Zulisman, all the way from UIA, from UTEM, from, from UM uh, ourselves. Thank you so much for all of that, that input, that sharing and that passion and that compassion. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I got some questions from the floor that uh, are we able to watch this webinar, uh, the recorded version? Yes, you will be able to watch it again. Um, we, as much as we can, we will try to, to convert all our webinars into YouTube versions and we will post it on our website for, for future references. So you could also check on that or use the same link that we have right now to, to share with the others. Uh, whatever um, session, the recorded session right now will still be online on the same link that we have um, that you're watching on right now. So uh, again, about the announcement that the uh, digital certificate will be available to those who, are, uh, who, who answered the feedback uh, form that we will post online on the live event Q&A. And I think that's the uh, that's the link uh, bit.ly bit.ly forward slash feedback underscore M A G A D. So magnetic. Academic discourse M A G magnetic A D academic discourse. So those that's the link you can scan the QR code or uh, key in the feedback form. And feel free, we will wait for you to, to um, key in your feedback about this webinar today. And we really appreciate your presence. And please, by all means, share the link with everyone else so that we can all share um, what the wisdom and the, and the experiences that we have all um, uh, experienced right now with all the other fellow colleagues. Yeah, so with that, uh, I would like to formally end this session. Uh, it's 12.06. Thank you again, Dr. Farah, Dr. Zul and Dr. Rose. We hope to see you again. And it's so lovely to see you all online. Uh, it's my first time berkenalan dengan Dr. Zul, but we are already good friends, Dr. Farah and Dr. Rose. It's so good to see you during this pandemic. Uh, Alhamdulillah. So um, without further ado, I will formally end this session. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you.